All right, we'll get started. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to another employability webinar brought to you by Outcome.Life and the good folk at Study Melbourne. This webinar is part of the Study Melbourne Career Catalyst Employability Initiative, and we encourage you to check out the many other free webinars on offer, all aimed at helping international students become more employable, whether you're looking to get a job here in Australia or back home. Today, I'm excited to speak to you all about careers in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Many STEM students find it difficult to make the transition from their university jobs that may be in hospitality into their field of study, uh, which may be in STEM. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So little housekeeping things, please um, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Um, also, please post your questions into the Q&A area. We're going to answer as many as we possibly can. Those of you who've been to our webinars before, you know that if it's one thing I love is uh, answering questions. So please don't be afraid to ask because a question that you might have, lots of other people are probably thinking about it. We have three STEM experts, and I would say gurus with us today to share their experiences. Uh, we have uh, Ruanji Fernando, researcher with Data61 at CSIRO, researcher and lecturer at Victoria University, a STEM change maker, founder of STEM Sisters, which I'm very excited to hear about, and uh, of course, um, lecturer at uh, Victoria University. We have Kusan Kalhara, who refers to himself as a life engineer. And Kassan, I'm going to get you to explain that a little bit later. Um, but uh, from what I see from your LinkedIn, it includes a professional engineer, project manager, and academic researcher, studied megatronics, which I'd love to hear about as well, um, during your studies at uh, QUT. And we also have Swapna, um, data analyst full-time with Infosys, um, after completing an internship with another tech company during her studies at Victoria University. Um, I'm really interested to hear um, Shropna's story because I think many of you can take her lead on how she went about getting um, a fantastic job uh, in her area of study. But I'd love to start with Rwanji. Rwanji, welcome. Tell us about yourself and uh, I'd love to hear especially about your work with um, STEM Sisters. Hello everyone, it's lovely to meet you over and I hope that we can continue these discussions face to face as we are, uh, you know, coming up with much more better plans for Melbourne and around uh, without no COVID situations. So I'm, I'm Ruangi, as Dominic mentioned, I'm a current PhD student, uh, so I'm almost about to finish my PhD, so very excited, almost four years of a journey. So um, particularly about STEM sisters. So this initiative support women of color in STEM, which, uh, you know, the terminology women of color is a very, very US terminology. What we try to include is culturally diverse and linguistically diverse women. So Australia, 50% uh, being either born in uh, overseas or at least one parent being born overseas, 50% of us is very culturally diverse. And this is, this is great news for Australia, honestly, in terms of STEM and innovation, because there is so much of research and so much of uh, recognition, how diversity impacts uh, innovation and that how that completely grows STEM and that end of the day put back into the economy. So it's, it's something such massive to have and Australia is privileged to have it. It's just that we wanted to see whether how much that privilege is really harnessed in, in the STEM sector and in the economy. So, and particularly, and also in like in most countries, 50% of Australia is in gender wise is female. And are we representing that as it is in our industry of STEM is a big problem. And of course, government and a lot of initiative have worked on this tirelessly work, are working in this matter in terms of putting more women into STEM. Uh, which is happening, which is great news to hear and which is which we are very passionate about. STEM Sisters is particularly focused of making sure that the culturally diverse women or linguistic diverse women are included in that equation as well, because there can be intersectionality. This is the terminology that we use, not just to be a woman, but to be 
culturally diverse or uh, to be with a disability or with belong to LGBTQ or, you know, the other, other aspects which you can kind of put like a double jeopardy, uh, not just to be identified as one, but as many, which has so much of less opportunities for them to be part of this uh, uh, industry and all of that. So that's particular. So from STEM sisters, our focus in this intersectionality is women of color. So we support women of color in STEM, and this is recent statistics that we came across in Australia. Um, unemployment rate of women of color or culturally diverse women of STEM qualified university STEM qualified is fourteen point one compared to unemployment rate of someone born in Australia being female is 3.3. Even men who are uh, STEM qualified born overseas, their un unemployment rate is 5 point. So we are at 14.1. And this is from 2006 to 2016. Before 2006, this rate, unemployment rate was, I, I, as I remember, it was somewhere around six. So we have basically have a lot to do in this space. Yep. So, uh, and even statistics shows that most of uh, PhDs in STEM has a large proportion of culturally diverse women. So end of the day, my mission began not just seeing the statistics because the statistics were not available before 2000, it was only available in 2020 July. So before that, in this similar uh, statistics, women were discussed, but not necessarily culture, culturally diverse women. So we were not sure with the statistics, but I have come across many like similar backgrounds like me and much, much academically and uh, stem wise so prominent women. They have come as migrants or international students, mostly migrants. They have worked in their countries in STEM domains in very high positions. But unfortunately, after migrating to Australia, with their, because of their qualification, they have migrated here, but they are not employed in their STEM domains. They are maybe doing something, they are maybe happy doing something else, but it's just such a, such a pathetic situation to look at because these women are not employed in their domain and not contributing as they wish to do so. So this is the problem we, with personal stories that I've come across and the number grew like how much I talk. So I felt that we should do something about it. So that's what the STEM sisters is for. So we mainly focus on in summary, try to retain support and celebrate STEM women of color in Australia. Yep, and so, and, and some of the initiatives, um, I remember speaking to you a couple of months ago about how that you offer mentors for many, um, for many of the students that you feel need it. Um, but what other initiatives um, do you guys do in order to get um, people employed in STEM? Yeah, um, Dominic, so for the, that question, in terms of mainly, as I mentioned, it, our focus is retaining, supporting and celebrating STEM women of color. Yep. So mentoring programs is one. Then we have a LinkedIn group because we, can, we see like personally I have faced I see an opportunity after opportunity deadline is passed. Or I've never seen that. Maybe I've saw that in the next year. Yeah. So we have a problem of not seeing the opportunity. So we yeah. have something called a LinkedIn group, which we call creating awareness of opportunities for right. STEM women of color. So yeah. at the time we have nearly 500, four, sorry, 450 members in that group. Yeah. In, 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 in summary, what we are doing is I'm tapping to another 400 uh, 49 people's network. Yep. So we share opportunities in that group. So this is only open for women, sorry, because you know that's the purpose of it. And yep. few volunteers who are with us in our group, which, which are part of our voluntary group, they are there, but it's basically open for women because we are focused on this matter. So we are sharing opportunities, encouraging these women to take part and then apply. And because it's LinkedIn, the other advantage, of course, I'm sure you can find all of these opportunities in Google. There is no problem in that. It's yeah. just that when we are sharing with the person who shared that information, so you're kind of getting a direct contact, little uh, like, you know, unofficial kind of contact with that person and they can see your profile if you start communicating with them. So you kind of create some sort of a relationship because that's what is needed to land a job or an opportunity in Australia. So that's one of them. So that's creating awareness and uh, of opportunities. And also, um, apart from the mentoring program, we try to celebrate STEM women. 
So we have been sharing stories because again, if you search on Google scientists, you only see most men, only few women. If you, and it's very less even to find women of color, right? In, in, so it, the, the people can't, like we say in simply, you can't be what you can't see. So it's yes. very important to showcase that you can do this. It's challenging for everyone. Everyone's professional journey but didn't come in a, like a gold platter or anything. Everyone had to work hard. It's just that you need to see that it's possible, right? Yeah. This can happen. So that's why, uh, so we try to celebrate and that's an inspiration for others to listen. So actually we are launching our podcast series as well because we have been only work, working in the written format of sharing the stories. As for International Women's Day, uh, we are celebrating that. Plus we are going to launch our podcast series. So that will also help. So that's one of the other initiatives. And apart from that, we do our, our social media channels is dedicated in awareness. So because it's very important, the rest of the 50% in Australia understand, okay, because you, you kind of blame them. They have never been in our shoes. They don't exactly understand what we go through. Like, you know, in similar, like any person's yeah. life. You know? yeah. If you, like for me to understand a particular disability, I have not, felt it as my own. So we need some uh, guidance and understanding to be, be, be with them on that journey. So similarly, our social media channels is dedicated to creating that awareness. So you may have seen, if you're going to our all social media channels, we share posts of uh, like, even our posts are more like visualized posts. So we are trying to make it more attractive to people to read and understand. So we are actually sharing some of the research papers or someone's finding, try to put it in a little bit more creative manner so that we are creating awareness. So these are some and, and one of our favorite um, people, Shoshani, um, actually asked, how can people connect with STEM sisters? Um, we did just put the link up to the um, LinkedIn group or page. Is there any other way they can join? Yeah, so there is a website. Uh, uh, we have a website. You can find that uh, stemsisters.org.au. And we have LinkedIn. We are in Twitter. We are, LinkedIn is the strongest uh, of us. We are in Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. Fantastic. Excellent. Kassan, give us the, uh, the male point of view about STEM. Tell us about yourself. And in particular, I'm very interested in you calling yourself a life engineer. I hadn't heard of that before. It takes off off mute. Yep. All righty. Thanks, Dom. Um, thanks for having me today. So basically, um, well, it's very similar to what um, Ruangi is doing, and that's 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 fantastic. Um, STEM Sisters has been there for quite a while, and I've seen their their progress and um, the impact that they make. So similar to what um, STEM Sisters is doing, the motive, the bottom line, um, bottom line intention is very similar. So what we do as life engineers. Um, we engineer lives, so that's simple as it is. So basically starting from different groups, diverse groups. So we have this program for uh, cult communities, we call it STEM for cult. So we focus on various diverse groups, including indigenous people, international students, uh, refugees, um, and also all sort of asylum seekers and other diverse groups in Australia. We basically support them and give them training to develop their STEM skills. And we know that a lot of, a lot of these diverse groups are um, holding, their, holding their back um, in terms of pursuing a career in, in STEM. So we need that motivation. So we're giving them the motivation and inspiration that they need to go to uni to explore what they can do to uh, get the most out of their potential to be a STEM leader in the future. So that's basically what we do at the bottom line. And we call this organization Life in Australia. And we are heading with a passion to inspire STEM communities, STEM generations, and um, revolutionizing the, the STEM interpretation uh, where you know, if you fail in maths in high school or in, in your previous stages of um, your education career, you don't have an opportunity to STEM, uh, pursue STEM careers. That's not true. So we are sort of like breaking that um, taboo ideas and um, we, are, uh, per, per, we are pursuing a, um, uh, we are creating a platform for all these diverse groups to come together to explore their STEM potential, um, to have a potentially to a, a um, STEM future. Wonderful. And, and um, tell us about um, your journey so far, especially in mechatronics. Absolutely. Um, so it's been, it's been obviously a roller coaster because, um, well, when we left 
um, high school, we didn't think about uh, this is what I'm going to do. We had a rough idea, I would say. I had a rough idea. I wanted to be an aerospace engineer uh, mm-hmm. when I left. I was, I was quite impressed with all the fascinating thing that Elon Musk was doing back then. Um, so I was, I was inspired by all this stuff. But when you get to know things, you don't have to stick to your original passion. So I kind of deviated. So what I did, I sort of diversified my learning curve um, to different disciplines. So I, I did four minors. I studied four minors in electrical, mechanical, software, and robotics wow. uh, while, while majoring in mechatronics. So I have that potential to go to any industry, to go to discipline, to, to go to any discipline and pursue a career. So um, starting as an, as an engineer was um, quite overwhelming uh, because you left high school, uh, the university and then you pursue a career in um, engineering, which is, which is real. Uh, but uh, my university prepared for for a real real world career, um, and I was not limited to engineering. I was not limited to to uh, the industry. I explored the other other avenues. For example, the academia like Ruangi has been involved in, and also um, project management and also research and development. So what I want to say here, uh, the 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 message is clear that you, just because you study STEM, industry is not your only goal, only opportunity. There are other opportunities in academia, in, in research and development, and also in project management. And there's a fourth thing, which I really want to add, entrepreneurship. International yes. students do not think about entrepreneurship. They don't think about startups. They only apply for jobs to work under someone, but there is this massive space, which is booming now, where yeah. you can find, you can create your own jobs and get other people to work under you. Well, well, Kassan, you might be able to help me because um, I'm actually, um, for the Victorian government, um, doing some presentations to 126 Victorian farmers. And I put the call out to the farmers to say, if you could have students in their final year doing their major project, capstone project, I think most people call it, what are some of the projects that you would like to work, uh, you would like them to work on? And they came back with a whole variety of things that I would love, you know, anyone in the audience perhaps to... um, to bring to my pre-accelerator program that I run um, with Latrobe Uni. Um, uh, and, and those were, one of them wanted um, a drone that could identify um, three specific types of weeds that can then be eradicated on their properties. Another one was to scare birds away from their crops. But like there's so many things that, um, that students could do. And especially with your background, Kassan, I might get you in as a mentor to help out on those projects. It's got everything. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, th- I do agree with um, what you just said, and I resonate the same. And automation is going to be the future. And yeah. automation is going to dominate most of the industries pretty much. According to stats, it's, it's going to be 42% of the jobs in the next 10 years uh, yeah. will be automated. So we are talking about automation and all the past few years, I mean, a past decade, we've been uh, building the systems, building autonomous systems to do some specific tasks, but we are now looking at um, beyond, beyond building or designing systems, we are looking at teaching them um, to give them intelligence, to train them so they can do whatever they want to do, whatever they would like to do, depending on the situation. As you said, the drone can learn itself to produce um, any sort of like a, perf- a performance um, and also achieve whatever the task that they are meant to achieve. Yeah, and just to emphasize your point about entrepreneurship, I think that STEM, people in STEM, they, they, they really are taught to problem solve. Therefore, they make the best entrepreneurs because they can look at a situation and, and think about how are we going to solve this problem? And the issue that I had with the farmers was that they did have these drones um, that would go and scare the birds away. But once their batteries were dissipated, how do you get a drone to autonomously go back and recharge itself and take off again. That would be a wonderful problem for someone to solve. I haven't seen anyone do that. Um, and so hence, you know, to me, that's a startup idea that I think, um, you know, um, students might want to take up. If, if that's the case, come and uh, talk to me. But our very first question, Kassan, I think um, you, might, you might want to have a go at answering it. And this is from Tyler. Um, and Tyler's asked, I've heard that science graduates have one of the least proportions of graduates um, going on to work in their field after study. If this is true, why is there such a push for students to go into STEM? What's your view? 
Absolutely. Um, that's a great question. A lot of science graduates have this, um, and also students who are like about to finish their science courses, they have these, these burning questions. Um, yes. Well, from my personal point of view, yes, there is a, a bit of a challenge in, in um, sort of like perceiving a career in, um, in science, but there are a lot of other opportunities. You need to look at the bigger picture here where there's a lot of opportunities to um, in research and development context. We need scientists. Like last year, this time, we didn't have much, much, much um, demand for scientists because of uh, because we didn't, we never faced that um, you know pandemic. But now we need scientists, and in the next few years, we need more scientists. And I've seen a lot of in, a lot of students perceiving a high school high school leavers are now interested in pursuing this. Um, these um, carriers and um, especially in science, like it doesn't matter what you do, biology or chemistry or whatever, there's, there's a future in the research and development because we are researching and most of the problems in the world remain unanswerable at this point. Yeah, well, I've just posted in the chat um, a fantastic study that I saw that was commissioned by Deakin University and Ford Motor Company um, and a couple of others. Um, but it was interesting to note that of the 100 jobs of the future, most of them were in STEM. And of those 100 jobs of the future, 53% of them don't exist yet. So hence, Tyler, why people are pushing their kids into STEM is because STEM is the future. And I, and I, and I always say that if the past 10 years was about mobile and social, the next 10 years is definitely going to be about automation and, and, and engineering. Um, and so, hence, you know, I think that's the future and there's a bright future for people in STEM. But speaking of bright futures, that brings me to you, Swapna. So, uh, so tell us about your, your journey so far, which is one that I really want to focus on because I think it could be a real shining example of how many students in STEM should go about getting a wonderful career um, in their discipline of study. Yeah, first of all, yeah, thank you for calling me over here. So I would just uh, give a brief background about myself. Um, uh, I was uh, interested into engineering since my teenage when I was on a teen. So when I completed my bachelor's in engineering in information technology, I as a regular uh, student, I joined companies, I worked for many companies, uh, multiple IT companies, I started as a programmer analyst. Then um, uh, across the years, I gained the corporate knowledge and uh, I went into this analytics. Somewhere there was passion within me that um, I want to get into deeper for uh, learning more into business analytics field. So then I realized uh, I want to dig into more uh, into this career. And uh, then I applied uh, for multiple universities and I, I got selected for a few and I selected uh, Victoria University to pursue my master's in business analytics. In Victoria University, I would say like, I got vast amount of knowledge from, from the perspective of how to groom yourself to get ready for competitive world. Although I had worked for multiple companies, I had work experience, but still how to how to groom yourself to be into the leadership management teams. Uh, so I gained all that knowledge and being an international student, obviously there are a lot of struggles uh, apart from studying. I was looking for jobs and uh, there were a lot of rejection emails uh, as you know, for international students. But I would uh, just like to say uh, to this, uh, my future students that uh, just make those rejection emails as a part of your life because, because if you uh, will, put down yourself. Uh, obviously, initially, it was difficult for me to see the rejection emails, having so many skills, having the work uh, experience. But um, you have to make yourself that much strong that uh, just uh, after some point of time, I started feeling that, uh, okay, this is a, just one opportunity out of the thousand opportunities that were in front of me. So, and uh, maybe this was not what was I made for. 
so that that was the thing that i told myself and uh, i made myself strong apart from that uh, during my university studies i gained another knowledge like another skills which were of my interest i did some research from my end uh, what the industry is or the, how the job market is working if after one year or after two years when i will be completing my studies what are the skills that these industries would be looking for so i i i myself in my work time in my me time like apart from my university assignments exams and other things apart from the work i made my other projects attended boot camps and um, that i pro- portrayed it on my resumes so and in the interviews that was a plus point for me that i would like to highlight to other students so yeah and after that uh, i landed up with a job which i wanted but that, but i think one thing that you missed there that i was um, hoping you'd talk about is that um you went to a terrific university in victoria university because yeah. they gave you the opportunity to do an internship yes and you did that for course credit how did that help you um get ready to find a job after you graduated yes before internship like because i had my work experience back from my own country so uh i did not have local work experience so somewhere that was giving a negative value or i would not say negative value but it wasn't giving a positive value to my profile when i was applying for jobs yep. but after i did my internship i tried to understand how the corporate culture works over in australia and that helped me a lot in my further interviews in my further study life so that was uh, obviously a great opportunity and it added value to my profile as well so i would really recommend someone who is getting a university although internship is an elective unit but uh, do yeah, just do it because it will firstly it will give you good profile and second thing it will give you knowledge and prepare you for the corporate world in australia and local experience is really important so yeah good good and that's um and and it's something that um we talk about all the time obviously it's what we do at our come up life place students into internships for course credit um yes it is unpaid but um you know as i say to my own children who are at university and my daughter started university today at RMIT and she chose her course because um uh, there's a mandatory internship as part of her course and and for someone that isn't going to be in the top 10% of of academia the ones that are, are going to have to go out and get a job you know to have some work experience when you graduate means that with all the applications that go to all those jobs you are going to find your way to the top of the list you know you've worked in the strain business you've worked in an area of your study you've got an uh, already started to create your network of people and all of that i think helps you um really get a job but going into that um and thank you um shwapna for that we'll get back to you um with a couple more questions in a sec um rawanji if you had to um if you had to uh write a letter to yourself a few years ago not many years ago because you're still extremely young compared to me but to say what you should do during university to make yourself work ready what are some of the things that you would um that you would advise a young self back in uni Would you say study would, would you say study more? Uh no of course I think one thing I should say I don't look back and reject regret anything in my life so yep. and I I think I've always done the very best that I could so I always go by that but even saying that I think I applied almost everything that I believed and I've whatever I've communicated to anyone who I've come across I've really applied them as best that I can I don't think I don't consider myself as a very studious student uh, <laughs> i've been once a bachelor of because i really wanted to kind of get it in what i have double masters one masters i i've told this in my classes also i really focused i i thought i wanted to get that medal and i did that which i have to sacrifice many things in order to really pursue that but in general i like to do many things that's who i am i do, i can't just do studies so other masters that i did i i got it through but it's not been 
five flying colors. But yeah. that's what I wanted to do in that part of life. So especially if you're doing postgraduate, you have the choice what you wanted to do with it. You may be having family, do many other commitments. It's up to you. It's just that you should know this is how much I put and therefore this is what I get in return. But in, in postgrads, I really suggest for people, mainly for postgrads, because this is where you should step into your career definitely after a postgrad. That's kind of the time, like, you know, that's definitely the time. There's no more after, right? Unless that you're going to be an academic and you go into a PhD and that part of line. If you're going to the industry, that's kind of the max level that you should really pursue a career. So in order to get ready for that, you should start when you start your master's itself. You cannot do it. I say this to my PhD colleagues with me because they always wait till finishing the PhD to think about what's next. So that couldn't happen. You should really start way back. So even myself, when I came here for my PhD, I, I just saw like, I know like I don't have the network and what am I going to do to build that network? So I did everything that I can to achieve that. Attending in my domain, I went into all the, um, um, uh, like, you know, uh, meetups to yep. uh, uh, any, any uh, like I've been to Microsoft, Google, uh, uh, um, what else, uh, some particular data, data related applications, yep. uh, things like that, hackathons, many things, right? Yes. So uh, I've attended personally, try to grow my network as much as possible. Yep. And the other tool that I use is LinkedIn. And I just been there since then, and then wanted to excel as much as possible I can. I have written personal messages to people to be part of my network, communicated with them, had the discussions afterwards, continuing the uh, online chat with them, sit down and see whether what we can work on. So network doesn't grow overnight. You have to do every day, every week, something to grow to that position. Initially, I used to write very, like, whenever I go for an event, I'll see all the speakers beforehand. Either I'll message them beforehand saying that I'm, I'm looking forward to see you, or either after going there, I'll see all of them and just would write, I really was fascinated about this section, what you spoke about. I really, so that's how I made the connection because I was no one, you know, in Australia, like, though I had my, you know, all the best experience back home in Sri Lanka, I was basically starting from zero. So people didn't know me. So there's nothing wrong from that end. I just have to prove myself or just, you know, push myself up to that level who I, who I should be deserving to be. And then I started communicating. So I was able to get that. I feel like, you know, top level of people in many organizations that helped me to grow my network very, pretty quickly. So I think definitely whatever the way your industry, your area of expertise, you really have to be, you should start by knowing what organizations are. If you are, because you are in uni, you should really find who are the rest of the people in uni who is in that part of area and try to connect with them because university is the place that you can get help. For me, my all achievement, Victoria University has all credits for everything. My learning, my STEM sisters, my internships, every success that I would achieve, STEM, uh, Victoria University owes that. Well, Rwan Rwanji, that goes one step further for me because I can thank um, Victoria University for my lovely wife as well because that's where I met her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, so but I just, yeah, yeah I've, just, I've been extremely happy and privileged to be there and, and the community. I, I'm sure it's, it's, it's how that all universities would treat all students. Personally, for me, I've just got it from there. And I've just, you know, knocked doors and they were really happy because they know you as a student. So yeah. that would be the first place to start. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Then it's the, it, the world is your oyster. So it's just the first place to start to get that initial bit of recognition. I yep. remember still when I did STEM Sisters way in 2017 when I initiated, there was one article published. That was the first ever article published in somewhere in Australia about me, right? That landed, the, so that's how I, I started posting on LinkedIn. And then I just, you know, people had to look at something to see who I am. Uh, it's very hard, you know, you, it's nice to grow your own trumpet in once in a way, but it should come from somewhere else. So that recognition gives you that upliftment. So in yeah. order to do that, you need to do voluntary work. Yeah. I know you can be a professional. I have worked eight years in my academic journey. I didn't say, okay, I want a paid job. Like, I, I do get that. 
I do get that we are like, you know, I'm an international student. I didn't come as a scholarship holder. I came as a full fee paying international PhD student, uh, you know, which that, so I, I was being in their shoes. I still understand, you know, because when, con when you convert the money, $10 to go up and down to the city, it was a big thing, end of the day. You know, though I earned so much back home, you know, converting that, this is just to transport. Yeah. It just was, you know, making me shake a bit, you know? So yeah. I was really evaluating. So when I go to city, I do the whole day. I go uni, I go uh, training program, I do this, I do that, and <laughs> just come home as fast, late as night as possible. I take the earliest train where I can go free to the city. So this was the struggle. So, you know, being there, you know, it's just you have to really push yourself. It's yep. hard. I agree. It's not easy. And I think not just international students, there are many people in life who face the hard. I'm sure in your back home, your country, there are far worse people in difficult situations. That's common for us. We all have a challenge. It's just that how much we want to push ourselves. If you do it, I'm sure you all see light end of the tunnel. Yep. And and so, and this was the conversation in the car this morning with my daughter on her way to RMIT for her very first day. I asked her, have you set up a LinkedIn account? No, dad. I said, well, guess what you're going to do by the end of today? And I said, and now you are going to start connecting with every single significant person and your friends, but mainly the significant people. Start with your lecturers. Start with the people we know in our network that one day may be able to help you to find a job or refer you to someone that can find a job. I posted in the chat meetup.com and eventbrite.com.au, two fantastic resources to find meetups for you to go to. And they are very, very important. And I said to her, as I said to my son, who's three years older than him, that it's now your job to go to at least one meetup every week and your job at that meetup, the industry meetup, is to meet the three most significant people in the room. And you are to connect with them on LinkedIn because that's how Australians manage their professional networks. And if you do that every week for your entire bachelor's, which will be three years in her case, you are going to have a wonderful network that is going to deliver you a job at the end. And you won't need to go and apply to thousands of jobs on Seek and Indeed only to get you know, all those rejections. Kassan, I see you nodding. Does this resonate with you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We've been talking about um, networking, which is the key element, key success, uh, the hidden key. Uh, as you know, there's only 25% of jobs in the market that are advertised. So if you uh, keep applying, you won't, there's, there's, the probability is not that good. Um, so the remaining 25% is through um, the networking. So I would like to sort of give four um, pointers for the, the job hunters or the, the students or recent graduates. So one thing is CDE, which I refer to as cross-disciplinary engineering. So now in the past, we've been, if you are, if you were a mechanical engineer, you've been working in, in the mechanical engineering discipline, but now today and in the future, you won't be working in the mechanical engineering field just as a mechanical engineer you'll be working in agriculture you'll be working in in uh, medical as at hospitals as a mechanical engineer so you need to think outside the box and your stem skills need to be translated to other domains that's really important that's why cde is important and the second thing is innovation and sustainability employers do do not need the traditional um Elect electrical engineers or the traditional mechatronics engineers. Now, employers need innovative because they are competing in the market. They need these innovative mindsets who can think also outside the box. And also you need to take sustainability into account. When you design solutions, you need to think about the sustainability aspect as well. And the third thing is PCE. You are a technical engineer or you are a technical STEM person, but also you need to have that project control aspect. So project management, implementation, maintaining cost um, controls and scheduling. So all these aspects will help you to secure a job uh, when you have these soft skills as well. And the fourth one, have a real passion because employers look, don't, do not look for what you studied back at uni. Employers look for real genuine interest. Some employers ask, you might have come across uh, this question. Some employers ask you um, about your own hobbies related to your STEM industry, about your 
projects that are related to you know with your discipline the projects that you've done in your own time outside university or work so these four things i believe for a um, for an in, for a for a graduate or a, for a student who's about to graduate it's really important yep and i i, I totally agree uh, i think the the hackathons one is big and doing projects outside of university is something that, um, that we really look for. I've got a software development company. We employ about 15 staff. And it's probably the most important question. If, if someone has not got projects going on in their personal life, then you know it's very difficult to convince me that you're passionate about what you're doing. So I find that really important. So hackathons, going to events, all that type of thing, I think is really important. Now we've got a couple of questions um, uh, piling up. There's one that I wanted to answer, and, and that was, um, how do you convince your employer to sponsor you and how to gain experience during study? Show them how valuable you are. Show them how much passion you have. Show them how indispensable you are to the business, and trust me, they will sponsor you. There was a terrific young man from Columbia who joined us after doing um, an internship with another company, they couldn't employ him, um, but he, he had such good reviews that we employed him and he, he didn't have PR at that stage. And this kid was so good. He wasn't the best DevOps engineer, but he had such a good attitude that an attitude is everything. And he'd work hard and stay back. And I remember turning up one day and I found him asleep on a beanbag in the office, um, which, you know, because... He had this issue he wanted to work on all night, or at least that's what he told me. He could have been doing anything, to be honest. But it didn't matter because he showed me how passionate he was. And we sponsored him on a, on a 457 visa. And terrific news came through only a couple of months ago that after eight years in Australia, he got his PR, which is wonderful. And we sacked him immediately. No, we didn't. We, he's still with us. Um, uh, he's, in, he's employed with us. So... So that's how you convince people, show them your passion and so forth. And another thing on passion too, and, and this is where a lot of students miss the mark. In going to industry events, just because you're a data analyst doesn't mean you only have to go to data analyst events. Find the industry that you're passionate about and go to them because they need data analysts. They need, as you said, Kassan, project managers, all really, really important. Let's see if we can hit a couple more questions. There was one that um, someone wanted to ask Swapna a question, and I might help you out with this one, uh, uh, Swapna. As most Australian companies ask for citizenship or PR, how do, we, how do we get around that? I'll just paraphrase it. How do we get around that? Well, uh, let me tell you, I'm not an Australian citizenship or PR as of now, but I have landed with my dream job. So. Uh, to that can be taken as a as a motivation to all the international students that yes uh, because as when I was searching for the jobs I was being told that you no know, you require a PR otherwise your chances are like five percent if you get a PR you you will land into a job very soon but that's not the case what I would like to say just try tried applying for the jobs and one more thing I would like to add on that that during your university studies just have a combined set of values not just one technical skill there are many skills that any job description just find where you want to go and have a combined skill set with you so when you pass out from the university you can portray yourself with that combined skill set which every industry looks and for because no industry will uh, hire you just for one or two skills so that will add a value to your profile in that way and uh, don't wait for uh, to end uh, till the end of the semester or till the end of your uh, coursework because start applying or uh, as soon as you have started with your courses because it will give you more and more experience what industries are looking for have the passion give value to your profile by doing other things apart from your curriculum so passion and patience i think are the most strong uh, uh, words or what you can have within yourself to land up in a job and as i said internships are really important to gain local work experience but i think yeah pr as uh, the question says the pr citizenship although it is important but i would not say that is 
And, and I'll add, and this is my experience, having now placed over 7,000 um, international students into internships in Australia and seen many of them turn into jobs, even for those who don't have PR. Two important points. Number one, large companies are not international students' friends. Simple as that. Any company with a HR department are going to have this stupid, ridiculous policy that you need PR in order to work there, okay? So my advice is... Go for smaller companies, go for startups, go for companies who value your skills rather than have to satisfy the tick on a box in their HR department. And I know it sounds terrible to say, but, and I can see the Kassan's nodding with me here, go for smaller companies. They don't care. They just need help with the, with the skills that you have. The other one is that if you do wish to work in a big company, make it a two-step process. Start in a smaller company. And I think, Swap, now that's really what you did, didn't you? You started, I think, in a smaller company and then got the skills and then was able to transfer into a bigger company. Um, you didn't need PR because you don't have it now. But I think that's a good strategy. Yes, obviously, I agree with that. Yep. And, and Kassan, what do you think of startups as a place to learn? Absolutely. Um, I think a lot of international students are worried that they don't get jobs. Like I had a friend who applied for 500 jobs, got three interviews, eventually managed to get into one position. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a pretty overwhelming process. But I think international students also need to roll their eyes out to startups. I have seen international students emerging from different states, in, including Victoria, with these innovative classic ideas who can attract sponsors, funds, government funds, and they have been very successful. I have classic examples of international students who launched their fantastic um, startups because they wanted to deviate from the trend. They, they wanted to break that tradition. Um, and I think it was really successful because um, at national level, we have been having these discussions and uh, it, at national level, most of the uh, councils need international students to pursue startups and entrepreneurship. And we've been talking about getting these entrepreneurship units embedded into the curriculum, Australian curriculum, which is really important uh, because that opens another door for international students to explore. Um, also, four things that I want to tell students, um, if you are a, a um, a first year student, I would say do everything as, as everybody said, do everything, apply for everything. I literally did every single thing that I could find when I was in my first year. In your second year, don't do everything, specify, narrow it down. And in your third year, prioritize, just like, you know, five to five to six things, prioritize and put your effort. And in your final year, if you are doing a fourth year, pick three things that will add value, that will contribute towards your future and work on that and put your sole effort onto those three things. I think that's the, that's the way. And in, during the process, you can open up your mind to look at the startups. And there have been a lot of startup uh, foundations, um, startup competitions, uh, pitching competitions, and as, as Rurangi mentioned before, hackathons, where you can pitch your idea and you can attract employers, but don't sell your idea in full to, to the public because that's yours. Well, although, you know, you do need to socialise your ideas. But a quick question for you, Kassan, very quick one. Is being a founder of a startup experience recognised? Yes or no? Simple answer is yes. Absolutely yes. Fantastic. You, you can add that on your resume because that's also an employability opportunity. In fact, it's even more than that. It shows that you've got initiative and you've got drive and that you're thinking about, you know, solving the world's biggest problems. Um, which is really good. Here's one for you, Rawanji. How do you find Australian projects, especially in environmental engineering, to work on? Um, environmental engineering, I'm not too sure that that's the space that I'm in, but uh, in terms of finding project, like if you're in STEM or IT, like I'm from IT, which is, you know, belongs to the same category, wherever you fix it, you know, it has to be very diverse as, as Kushan and, and um, my colleague, uh, you know, pushed that through. It's very important that we don't fix into because these are areas which can even from business to all the other uh, different types of, uh, you know, the industry which we can push. Now, if I tell you my example, so I'm basically an IT person and then later more like IT management area. 
that's my 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 what I pursue back home. And when I came here, I wanted to like upskill a bit and to be in like machine learning because I wanted to be a little more techy than less techy. So with that sense, my project aligns with transportation. So I'm seeing how planned special events affects congestion. So, but I'm not a transportation engineer, no clue at all, no, not yep. done civil engineering yep. before. Yeah. So, but I, I was able to land an internship for six months with the Department of Transport, where my other two colleagues were engineering background. So, but I, I could sell myself to them, you know, solving a particular problem that they didn't look at before. Yep. So that's what I'm saying. You can apply yourself in many, many ways. So that, to me, how, yeah. to, to, me uh, to me, and it goes with what you were saying, though, you've got to get yourself out there. This is why I said to my daughter in the car this morning, as of today, this week, you must go to a meetup every single week. And normally the best ones are on a Thursday. I don't know why. I don't know, maybe be as cheap on a Thursday night or something. I don't know. But you must go and talk to people. Don't go and sit in the corner with your mate. In fact, don't go with your mates, especially if they're shy and they make you look after them. Your job is to connect with people there and to connect with the most significant people. And there was a question earlier that said, how does connecting with significant people help you? Well, if you're connecting with significant people and you're talking to them and you're sharing what you're doing and they're telling you what you're doing, this is how you get a job. This is how you find projects to work on. I know myself, I go to meetups looking for staff. I remember going to, uh, we needed a, um, a mobile app made and I went to the Flutter meetup um, in Melbourne. It's on about the middle of every month. And I saw this young man and um, I saw he had a PC. So of course I made fun of him because real IT people don't have PCs. They have Macs. But then he opened up his PC and showed me that he'd taken the horrible um, Microsoft rubbish off it and had put Linux on it. So therefore, I knew this kid's really serious, right? You got a full on Linux machine. So then he made fun of me. I offered him a job that night and he now works for me as my team leader. See, employers go to meetups looking for talent. And by going to meetups, it means that when you're speaking to them, that's the interview. There's no application. You're not competing with anyone. So by going to a meetup, meeting an old ugly person that looks a little bit like me could be the best thing you ever do because you tell me that you know how to use Flutter and how to create an app. Who knows? I might offer you a job or a project to work on to test you out and then I'll offer you a job. So these are the things that international students need to do. See how this isn't sending out 200 applications to jobs on seek and getting rejected every time, right? It's about getting out there. And, and doing those things. So really, really important. Well, we're getting lots more questions coming up. Um, I don't know if you guys had any questions for each other, you're welcome to. Oh, hey, Don, when I wanted to add on that a little sure. bit. It's just that maybe you couldn't like, you know, of course you need to find these people, but you can share your projects on LinkedIn, like in terms of storytelling, what you have been doing, sharing yeah. screens, short, like, you know, what, like how I relate to it, it's through my PhD work and the things that I do, but I try to educate the audience. This is what I'm at. I used to, I used to take part in competitions where we communicate the PhD in three minutes because end of the day, it needs to be understood by the general public. Fantastic. So, you know, you know, sharing, you know, broadly, how I'm going to solve the problem is the STEM part. But people are interested about the problem and what are, what are we doing about it? So you need to share that. Then only you can find, I have, after doing that, I've come across people from even other countries who have reached out to me. Also, we are also working on something similar. This is a way to collaborate. So it's just that you have to be out there. Don't feel bad. You may like, like being international, English is not most of us our first language. Yep. We can have drama mistakes. That's all fine. You may be like, if you do it once, you will get a little more confident next time. If Correct. you don't do it, you never get it. So you just and, be there. You know, and, and people are lovely. You know, there can be bad people everywhere in this world. It's not just about a race or a gender or ethnicity about bad people. So just forget about that. Just be yourself and take your passion. You have to be passionate because people read that. People read that very quickly. Yep. So then you'll be passionate, you have confidence, and you just have to show yourself. And you've got to be active. You've got to be active going to meetups. And it doesn't matter if meetups are online or in person. They're both useful. And the other one is you've got to be active on LinkedIn. 
comment on people's posts, share articles. This is how you're going to connect with people. And one of our favorite people, Shashini, and I'm um, sorry, Shashini, but we're going to post that video in, um, in, the, uh, in the chat for people to go and have a look at. Shashini, when I met her, was about to start her internship and she had 14 connections on LinkedIn. I was number 15. 10 weeks into her 12-week internship, she had 500 connections and got offered six jobs. Six. I know because I helped her choose which one to accept. And it was a second one that she was offered that she ended up taking. And her story is fantastic. So if Anya, you could please post that and please connect with all of us on LinkedIn. You'll see our LinkedIn things here. A couple of quick questions before we, um, before we finish up because we're getting to the top of the hour. Is it hard for international students to get an internship? No, by going to meetups, it's easy. Meet people, ask them about their business, say, hey, would you like me to come and do some work for you three days a week for 12 weeks and I get credit from my university? Who on earth would say no to that? Having a beautiful, young, intelligent, um, lovely young person coming in and helping them out in their business. But if you are struggling and if your uni makes you find your own, please come and talk to us at outcome.life. We can help you. No problem there. Did you have anything to add to that, Shwapna? Because I saw that you... Yeah, obviously, I said, uh, uh, for me, university had provided me internship. So that was a good opportunity. From uh, But apart from that, even uh, I wanted to do more in my vacations and all. So I tried to do uh, unpaid internships. I approached uh, and... I had got one, but uh, later because of my other plans and ideas, I did not accept it. But yeah, there are uh, opportunities if you go and ask people and portray your skills to them. Wonderful. Another one was, uh, is it a different career path for international students who are doing their masters when compared to those doing a bachelor's? I would probably say no, it's, it's roughly the same, just different levels. Would that be fair? Okay, that's yeah. a good one. Um, how do you find, what's the best way to look for startup companies in Australia? Go to meetups, go to startup meetups, um, study, uh, Startup Vic is a fantastic place. Go to their meetups, Launch Vic. Um, if someone can type that in the chat, that would be really good. So that's uh, a couple of good ones. Let's see if there's anything else that we need to answer. Um, uh, what is the best way to approach the right person in a meetup? Fantastic question. I love this. This is going to be the one piece of gold that you're all going to take away from you tonight on how to approach people in a meetup. Go up to someone that is standing by themselves and looking very uncomfortable because no one is talking to them. They'll look a bit like this. No one's talking to me, right? Go up to them and with a beautiful, smiley, friendly face, say, hey, welcome. My name's Swapna. What brings you here this evening? Trust me, they're going to be so relieved that someone is finally talking to them. And they're going to tell you all about themselves and their life story. And that's where you get in your mind what you're about to say to them. And it should go something like this. Wow, well, it's interesting you say that because guess what? I'm an aeronautical engineer and I can help you design that new ultralight aircraft that you were just talking about you were looking to create or something like that. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's really simple and please write it down. It is, hi, my name's Rwan Rwanji. What brings you here this evening? And that's all you need to say and the rest will be history. But a little bit of advice. If the person is a dud and dud in Australian means someone that you shouldn't spend much time with, don't be afraid to cut the, um, uh, to cut the conversation short because you've got to meet the right people in that room. You get one opportunity you don't know who you're going to miss out. Speaking of cutting things short, we've now reached the end of our webinar. And as you can see, all of us, we could talk for hours. And I thank you so much for you guys joining us today and the people who attended, who are listening in, and the many people who are going to watch this recording over the next couple of weeks. We thank you very much. Our next webinar, Industry Engagement Forum, on March 16. Thank you so much, Rwanji. Kassan, thank you so much. Swapna, you've been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Please, everyone, feel free to connect with us all. Make sure you send us a personal note. And we look forward to seeing you all in other webinars soon. Thank you, Study Melbourne. We love you. And Study Melbourne loves everyone back. Thanks, everyone.